We kick off tonight, we are, are finding ourselves back in the, the New Testament, back into 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3. And so I don't want to invite you to uh, open up your Bibles, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, if you can't find it, ask your neighbor to help you find it. Uh, electronic devices are fine. If you don't own a Bible, there's Bibles at the end of all of the aisles right there. Feel free to snatch one of those babies up. Um, and uh, as we look at, uh, from verse 8 down through 16 here tonight, uh, we are, are going to continue. This is really the second part of a message. Uh, that first part of the message was in the first seven verses where we were looking at uh, the selection of elders. What does that look like when you select elders? What, what is the call of the elders? What are the, what are the standards? What is that baseline that God has within his word uh, about the character uh, of an elder and all that? Uh, we answered all of those questions. Uh, we even got into those sti sticky topics of, well, can women's be, women be elder? And we answered that definitively, and we saw that that was a, a no, uh, that that was a role and a call for, for men. And so uh, as we resume this series here, uh, I also want to make sure here that I'm, I'm reminding you, because it's been a while, that as we go through these pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, um, the, the steps that we're looking at, the information that we're looking at, the direction that we're, we're looking at, all of this stuff, it's the building blocks of ministry. This is how God uh, builds his church. You know, he starts with individuals and he, he, he sets gifting within the body. Uh, and there's certain standards that he has, uh, both for the minister and for the selection of leadership. That's kind of what we're in the middle of right now, uh, which is why in our 10 minutes of prayer that we were praying for pastors, elders, deacons, worship, and all of that stuff. That's, that was the reason that we were in that particular vein. And so the building blocks of ministry is what we're looking at here in the pastoral epistles um, uh, in, in, in a thematic way, if you will. And so uh, on our first leg of this chapter, of chapter three, we... Uh, we learned about the elders, but we saw that God has placed elders within the church. Uh, there's a very specific role that they have, and that role is to build up the body of believers. Uh, and, 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 and we learned that the, the life of the elder, the one that is called to stand in that spot, the men that are called in there, that, that really, uh, I, I think we gave the title and we said that they were like model Christians, if you will. And, and, and those characteristics, the things that, that are laid out here in these first seven verses is dealing with the inner life. What is the inner life of that of the elder? What is the home life of the elder? What is the church life of the elder? Uh, you know, what does it look like for the elder in the community? All of those particular things were laid out. And now, and now tonight, we come here to this second leg. And we, we move on from elders, and we, we began to talk about deacons, or, or I should I say that Paul begins to write about deacons uh, and, and their role within the, the local church. Um, and so that's what we'll see here tonight. Uh, but before we get to that, before we unpackage those things, does anybody remember what the main focus of is, the main verse, the main focus uh, of, of 1 Timothy? Do you happen to remember what you were taught, although it has been weeks, uh, weeks ago, months ago now, I guess, maybe a month, month and a half, whatever. Uh, do, do you remember what the main focus of the epistle to, in 1 Timothy, what this was? Take a look on the screen, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. This is the main thing, okay? Here's what it says. It says, so that if I am delayed, Paul says he's writing to Timothy, and if he's delayed, he says, you will know how my people must conduct themselves in the house of God. Let's just stop for a second. Keep that up on the, on the, on the screen here. So who is this? You will know how people, I look out at you guys. Are you people? Okay. This is so, yeah, some are more passionate people here. <laughs> yes. This is for the family of faith, okay? So my people will know how to conduct themselves in the household of God. This is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and the foundation of truth. And so, so Paul was giving this to Timothy so that he would understand in Ephesus how he was supposed to lead. In 2022, we have these same things. So that, you know, the building blocks of, of, of God's house, that we understand that God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His ways are not going to change. And, and there's these simple truths that we have right here in the scripture that, that we are to walk out and we are to understand so that, so that the work that God is doing, it's done his way and not according to our way. It, it, let me give you some examples of things that are done our way. 
Listen, when a church is mo- uh, losing momentum or what it feels like is losing m- momentum, listen, if the, if the leadership of the church thinks that they have to conduct more things and move faster and put better programs and, and, and change up and maybe add to it a different, uh, you know, um, in, in worship they move to this place to where they're drawing in secular songs and all that stuff. Listen, that's a man-made circus that's not leading according to the ways of God. God has a very specific way that he wants things done. And when God's people are in step with God's heart, his will, and God's people are hearing God's voice because they they understand what he's laid out here, the building blocks of his church, then what can we expect? We can expect God to do great things. We can, expect to, we can expect to continue to grow in season and out of season when I'm going through the tough stuff, when I'm on the, on the top of the mountain. And, and guess what? Guess how God's work is done? It's brick, brick by brick. It's not this great big old wave. It's like, whoo, and, then it's, and, and then that's it. No, 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 no. God builds our lives day by day, moment by moment. It, it, you know, if, if I could reduce it to this, it's, it's, a, it's Sunday by Sunday. It's Wednesday by, by Wednesday. It, it is those small incremental moments here where I'm spending with the Lord morning by morning. And, and I'm hearing from the voice of God. It's a real walk with the living God. It is not a religious show. It is not a religious stirring up. And, you know, how high can I get my emotions? And how high can I jump? And how great do I feel? Listen, all of those things are the entertainment of a passing world. When we come into the sanctuary, when we open up the scriptures personally, wherever we're at, we are, we're opening up and we're hearing the voice of God as, as, as these words describe his heart to us. And when we talk about growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, for us to grow in that, we need to understand God. That's why we study the scriptures. That's why we read the scriptures is so I understand the Lord and what he has spoken, and then I can adjust my life accordingly. And so... Um, you know, in, in, a, in a season of world history that we're in right now, specifically within our country, uh, you know, the work of the pastor is, is super difficult. Uh, why? Well, because it's the pastor that is called to implement God's will within the local church. And in, in, in our age, we're in an age of spiritual decline. You know, our country's not in a place of revival. It's not it's seeing anything like that. You know, if, if we see anything, we see the antagonism, if you will, against God, against Christians against the church and all these antagonistic things that are there. Listen, the pastor needs the help of the elders and the deacons. Why? To ensure that God's work is done God's way. And to ensure that, that, that God's will is being implemented within the church the way that God wants it done. And, and, and these things, you know, a chapter like this becomes super important for us to be able to, to discern that, to soak that up. And so by design, well, what are deacons? Well, deacons are the practical helpers, if you will, in the body of Christ. And and, and what we have in the middle of this chapter, from verse 8 down to the end, we have a picture here. We have these baseline standards that, that, that this is not just for some sequestered leadership people thing that, that the, well, the leaders of the church got to know this. Yes, but it's for the body of Christ. So the body of Christ is not ripped off. So we understand collectively or corporately, if you will, what God has to say about these things. And so take a look at your Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, um, picking up middle of the chapter. Paul writes this to Timothy. He says, he says, likewise, uh, the deacons, they must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to wine, much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For those who have served well as a deacon obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. For God was manifested in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen by angels. He was preached among the Gentiles. He was believed on in the world and he was received up in glory. Amen. And so, so what do we have here? Well, we have a few things that we need to take note of. Now, remember, this is Wednesday night. This is not Sunday morning. So this is not evangelistic in the, in the scope of this message in any way. Uh, this is really just going through the verses, the nuts and the bolts 
of, of what we're finding within the scriptures here. And the things that we need to take note of is, is well, well, God has placed standards of protection within the church. And, and these protections, they're for the healthy leading and the nurturing of believers. So this becomes of chief importance to you guys uh, and, and to you folks that are, that are, that are watching online and, and uh, that will listen on the radio and all that stuff. Listen, this stuff is, is chief importance for the body of Christ because we need to make sure we're being led in the right way and we need to make sure uh, that we're being nurtured in the right capacity. That is really important. So this chapter, super huge. Now, now let me show you a couple ideas here, okay? Uh, maybe I should call these not ideas, but rather lessons. So lesson number one here is, as we consider this is beware of bad examples. How appropriate. If we, if we want to understand what God is up to, we have to study what he said. But we also want to take the full counsel of scripture and we want to see how he has given to us bad examples within the scripture so we know and we can recognize, we can discern spiritually the difference between the two polar ends, if you will. And so the first one is the bad examples. Now, uh, in the Old Testament, I, I, I believe these verses will be on the screen here. Um, but if you'd like to follow along in your Bible, we're going to be going to Leviticus chapter 10. Because in the Old Testament, we find the high priest. This was Aaron. Now, Aaron had two sons, uh, Nadab and, and, and Abihu was, was the name. Uh, very interesting names, by the way. Uh, but in Leviticus chapter 10, we see that there's, uh, while Aaron was a good leader, his two sons that followed in that lineage that came in the line of, of, of doing ministry and all that stuff, these guys were bad leaders. They were terrible leaders amongst the assembly of God's people. They should have never been there because their heart was was not in the right place. And check this out. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 and 2 says this. It says, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, that each took his censure, and he put fire in it, and he put incense on it, and he offered profane fire before the Lord, which he, this is God, which God had not commanded them. And so fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. We're looking at being aware of bad examples. In the verses, in the chapter just prior to this, we, we, we see Aaron offering an offering to the Lord, and, and God accepted that offering in a powerful way. We see his sons follow through in a way here, and the scripture tells us, New King James says, this is profane fire. Uh, you know, I've always, I, I, you know, for years, I wonder, well, profane fire, what does that mean? You know, I, I didn't get all of this. Here's the idea if, you, if you're, if you're uh, trying to figure that out. It, it, it's that these guys were, were acting in the things of God without the mind of God. It was self-imposed religion. God did not give them the direction to perform this type of a thing. Remember, these guys were in that priestly order, and what they were to do was ministering to the Lord. What pastors are to do is, is, hey, same thing. We minister before the Lord. We take what God has given and we make sure that we're passing that out. Pastors, teachers, we're, we're, we're distributing what God has said. We're bringing the application of these things so, so that the body of Christ will come to maturity, that we'll, the body of Christ will grow up and come to maturity. And, and what these guys did is, is a, uh, you know, these bad examples, the, this profane fire, they acted in the things of God without the mind of God. It was a religious process. Now, also on the screen here, Colossians chapter 2, verse 23, we see this over in the New Testament. So if we're kind of balancing Old Testament and New Testament together, take a look at the New Testament. He says, these things indeed, they have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. These guys were indulging the flesh. Uh, they saw dad do something and they said, you know what, we're going to do it this way. And they, and they completely stepped out of line and God said, mm -mm -mm, it doesn't go that way. And praise the Lord, we're not living in the Old Testament, huh? Wow. Let me give you another example. Flip, uh, flip ahead in your Bible if you can follow along. Uh, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2, and here's a second bad example, okay? So we went from Aaron and his sons, and now we go to Eli and his sons. So he too is standing in this place of the priesthood and all that. And in uh, his case, he's got two sons, also crazy names, Hophni and Phinehas, if that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, you know, these guys, uh, these guys, they abuse privileges and they seduce women. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2 in verse number 12, 
uh, it says this about these guys. It says, now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. And yet, what were they doing? They were standing in this place. They were standing before God's people. They didn't even know God. And they were performing these works for God, and they didn't even know God. That is a big, fat no-no, folks. Now, now we find in the same chapter, uh, chapter 2 as well, skip ahead here, verse 22. You might also see it on the screen if you don't have it on your, your lap there. <clears throat> uh, and so now we have a further thing. It says, now Eli, remember, this is the dad and also the priest, that he was very old, and he heard everything that his sons did to all Israel. And how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So, so between verse 12 and verse 22, these priests would send their servants and they would demand, they would force, they would, they would literally take by force, if you will, offerings from the people. Now, how do you collect offerings in this church? How do we do that here? Do we demand? Do we pass the plate? Do we put it before you and shake the little baggie here? Feels a little light today, folks. <laughs> no, we don't do that. We don't take offerings. We receive offerings. As the Lord moves upon your heart, as you grow up in Jesus, you understand what your responsibility is. And, and, and quite honestly, do we even talk about offerings here? Not unless it comes up in the scripture, right? We're not, we're not really talking about that. You don't even find us you know, publicly praying over these particular things. But what these guys did is that they were forcing and, and, and they were doing it in such a way that the people's hearts were completely turned off. They no longer wanted to do it. Additionally, verse 22, what they did, uh, it, this is like that, 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 that Canaanite ritual sex practice, okay? Uh, you, you, you find a, an example also in Numbers chapter 25, verses 7 and 8, when there was a plague that fell over the top of Israel and the people, because this is what was going on. This stuff. Well, these, these kids, these guys standing in that place of serving God as lower level priests, man, uh, they, were, they were seducing the women and leading them into a bad place. Well, God deals with them too. Look at verse number 34. Um, yeah, 34. Where am I at here? Gracious. Okay, verse 34. It says, it says now uh, this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas, in one day, they shall die, both of them. And God put them to rest. He did exactly as he said. Now, these are bad examples. Um, we must understand that, that when God raises up somebody to take care of his people, he expects for that to be done. And he's very serious about that. And, and these two different bad examples that we've seen here, uh, two sets of, of, of time frame, two sets of families and all that stuff, uh, when, when God is serious, man, he makes sure that that happens. Now we move on, okay? Let's move on. Let's flip back to Hebrews here for a second. Uh, excuse me, First Timothy for a moment. And, and, and now we come to the other side. Now here's another lesson, okay? So we're, all we're doing is exposing both sides of the coin before we get into the depth of the details about the deacons. Oh, so on the other side of the coin, we need to commend the good examples. So we need to beware of the bad examples. We just saw that from Aaron's sons to Eli's sons. And now the other side of the coin, once again, is that we need to commend the good examples. Take a look at the screen. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. It says, Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the examples of their faith. Right? This, this, is, this is so classic Paul. Right? Because Paul said this also in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, actually. Uh, what did he say? He says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's the idea, is that imitation. Uh, and man, that is the best way that discipleship is born out. You know, sometimes you guys come in here and go, why does pastor tell us those kooky stories? Why does he share all the depth of struggle that he's gone on through the course of all the years? Because discipleship is born out through the choruses of real life experiences. It, it is born out as, 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 we, as we articulate, as we, as we describe the failure situations that we've been in, and then we, we, we realize that the intervention of the grace of our God leads us into greener pastures, that he carries us through the difficulties of all of these things. And, and, and we need to remember that, man. We, we need to remember, we need to commend the good examples of the good leaders that God has placed around us, and that they would continue to keep doing their job and that we would continue to pray for them. And so we started the service off here tonight in that way. Hey, pray for your leaders, man. Pray for them. Keep praying for them. Don't stop praying for them. Um, now, when we look at the examples, uh, we, we, we go back to the Old Testament again. 
uh, in the Bible, we have these examples. We got men like Joseph. You think about Joseph in uh, Genesis 39. All the way back there in, in Genesis 39, we see Joseph. He comes from old Jacob. And the things that, that Joseph had to walk through, God gave him visions early on as a teenager. And, you know, and, and these things his brothers hated him for as he shared those different dreams. Uh, and his dad questioned, like, what is this all about? Poor Joseph ends up getting sold into slavery by his, his brothers. He ends up here in um, Potiphar's house, who was an officer of Pharaoh. And while he's in Potiphar's house, well, what happens? Well, Genesis 39, verse number 9, um, Joseph is, is in this place, and his master's wife, Potiphar's wife, tries to, tries to, to get him to sleep with her, right? And they're the only two that's in the house. And here's Joseph's response, verse 9. He says, there is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me, his master, Potiphar. He hasn't kept anything back from Joseph except for the woman, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And so it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house were inside. And that she caught Joseph by his garments saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and he fled and he ran outside. Listen, this, this is a tremendous example because the example that we have here in Joseph is that, uh, that number one, that he was a faithful man. He was faithful when? When nobody was watching. Those are the types of leaders that we want, and these are the types of things that we, that we want to mimic, uh, that, that we want to emulate, if you will, within our life. We want to be faithful when no one is watching because God's eyes on every situation. He knows. Number two, we find that, that what Joseph did is, is that when he was in a compromising situation, that, that he fled. He took off running. And, 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 and you know, sometimes the best answer to the, to the problems that we get into is to depart. We just got to get out of there, man. We can't continue to remain in that. And then the third thing is, is, is that, well, what else do we know about, uh, uh, about Joseph? Well, not only was he, he sold into this aspect of slavery here, he ends up in Potiphar's house. Now from this, now he is a, a, you know, accused of attempted rape, and now he's put in jail, and now he spends an, another sum of time there as well. But what do we know about him? That he endured all of these particular hardships, and he did them in a very patient capacity. And God was with him in every step of the way. And so too you and I can remember that. That, that as we go through hardship, we want to emulate those things that are pleasing to God. We hold fast to God regardless of the situation that falls upon us. Because there are situations, gangs, that we go through. And God does these things. He allows us in the hardship because he's refining our heart. He's testing our character. He's developing our char character. He's growing us in these areas where we have, where we have lack within. Listen, over the course of my life, this is no surprise to you guys, especially on Wednesday night here, it's no surprise to you, <clears throat> that I'm a passionate man. I'm a type A guy for sure. But, but, but I think some of that personality profile stuff, uh, you know, some of that stuff can cover over the real challenge with me. I'm an emotional dude. Not in a cry, cry kind of type of a way, but, but, but on the other side of the scale. And that's been something that God has had to work, work on me for the, you know, the past 30 years. I'd love to tell you that I'm, I'm, he's done with me in that area, but I don't think he is. You know, I'm still learning these things. Sometimes I come and I stand before you. I'm an emotional train wreck on the inside. You don't know what's going through my eyes. And, you know, I come whining off the stage. I go, well, I really bombed that. I'm, you know, I pull the old Eeyore moment and everything and all that. You know, and some of these guys around here, they'll say, dude, what are you talking about, man? That was a Holy Spirit moment, and God did this and all this stuff. And I'm going, oh, you know, poor, <laughs> you know, bore me, you know. But, but you understand that, okay? I mean, that's just a weakness of me, man. I'm emotional in that regard. And so uh, I hate it, but it, it's for real. And so this, this character, Joseph, man, this is a dude that we want to emulate. Uh, let, let's advance ahead for just a second. Flip back to, uh, uh, where are we at? First Timothy. Uh, flip back there and, and just park there. Um, because who are we dealing with here? We have Paul writing to young Timothy. Okay, when we opened up this book, we saw that young Timothy, uh, that he was struggling in the faith. And, and, and that Paul wrote this encouraging thing. Hey, hold fast, man. I know you feel like you want to run, but hold fast. Don't go anywhere. Stay there and press on. Well, young Timothy as we look in the book of Acts, we see that this is Paul's son in the faith, right? Paul takes him in. 
And in, 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 in Timothy, he models that stuff that was taught to him from Paul. He stuck with Paul through the hard times. You know, uh, there's, there, there's uh, uh, I, I got so many favorite verses, but there's this one verse that's just popping in my mind right now. And I think I want to share it with you. Um, and I'm thinking clarity in my brain here. Here it is, Ecclesiastes 10 and 4. Uh, let me just read it to you, okay? Uh, if the spirit of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post, for conciliation pacifies great offense. What is that all about? You know, sometimes you, we're going to get into problems and skirmishes and all of this stuff, and it, it, you, know, it, you know, there's that propensity of like, I'm bolting, I'm out of here. You know, we have this fight, you know, I'm done with this thing. Uh, not as a Christian, you're not. As a Christian, we understand that we, we hold fast. We hold that post, whatever God has put us within, and we stay put. And when it's easy and when it's hard, and that's young Timothy, man, he stuck with Paul through the hard times, man. He didn't go anywhere. He stayed right with him. What else do we know about Timothy? Well, that he was willing to serve wherever he was needed. And he went wherever he was called. Paul sent him out on this. Boom, he did it. He went. And he endured without giving up. And that's a secret there for us. We do this without giving up. These are those character traits that we want to emulate these are, these are the, uh, you know, in that, that second lesson, if you will, that other side of the coin, bad example, good example. We want to we note the good examples, and that's what we want to follow. Now, we come to the third and the final point here for tonight, and that really takes us back here to this portion of Scripture that we're in, uh, the third lesson, and that is the baseline of standards. So God has a baseline of standards here for deacons, and these are the things, uh, again, this is, this is for you guys personally to take this stuff in. It's for you, for you to understand and to know because, because the healthier that your leadership is, the healthier that you're gonna be. If the head is sick, what happens to the body? The whole body is sick, right? If the head is healthy, what happens to the body? The whole body is healthy, right? So, so, so these things are of the utmost importance for the church to know. And, and for some reason, you know, we find pastors that get it into their mind. Well, these are the pastoral epistles. I really don't need to be teaching them to the, to the general fellowship. And I'm going, well, why the heck not? Why do we not want to teach the fellowship? We want the fellowship to know these things because it's God's word. And when, 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 when the church is ran and governed and led and served and built up God's way, then, then the people are healthy, man. We have to go through the entirety of these teachings. And so the baseline of standards here, uh, the instructions about deacons. Let's do this in two movements. The first movement is this. First, let's define deacon, okay? Uh, this is gonna be on the screen, and for whoever's controlling media, keep it on there for an extended period of time for the folks, just in case they wanna copy that word for word. Uh, remember, once and again, that once the service is done, I don't know, about 10 minutes after service, all of these notes are online. You can get on the app and you can just press notes and everything is on there. So if you happen to miss something on this, it will be on the app here, uh, you know, a short time following service and all that. And so here we have, uh, let's define deacon. Deacon is this. One, by virtue of office assigned to him, he cares for the poor. He has a charge of and distributes money collected for their use. Uh, deacons are seen as the proverbial head waiters who supervise ministry and serve where the need is. So that's a deacon. Now, everybody in the church may not hold that title of deacon, but I'll tell you this, if, if, if we could understand the heart of service behind head waiter and serving where the need is, if all of the church exhibited that type of, um, that expression of faith, that expression of care, that, ex, that expression of, of applying your hand to the, to the plow in the body of Christ, there would be zero needs inside of a fellowship. You wouldn't continue to see within the bulletin, we need help here, we need help there, we need this, we need that. You wouldn't see any of that stuff. You know, you, you would just, there would be no announcement that would be made regarding those particular things. So as the body grows into a healthy capacity, guess what happens to the needs? The needs begin to get uh, absorbed. They go away because the people are responding to God, not to the pastor, not to the bulletin. We understand, we understand, and we understand. And when we hear God's word, we apply God's word, what happens? I become a doer of God's word. I'm growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. It's not head knowledge. It's not religion. It's not I heard this great sermon at church, and I went home, and 
I, I forget what he said, and my life has not changed. Listen, let, the, let your experience of walking with Jesus, especially as you come to this fellowship, may that not be your experience in church. May, may when you come to church, may you expect to hear God's heart. And as you expect to hear God's heart, may you go away having heard what God said. And may you put into practice what God is calling you forward to do. Um, beautiful. And so that's a fancy definition of a deacon. Uh, it's not my definition, but it, there it is. Uh, here's my definition, okay? Uh, what, what are deacons all about and what do they have to do? Here it is. Uh, deacons have been given authority, okay? They've been commissioned by God. Deacons have responsibility. Responsibility for what? Well, to care for others. Uh, to, to, to literally to distribute funds uh, to the needy, right? And, and man, I, I will tell you this. We can't get enough deacons in this church. We need more deacons. So if God is identifying you, we, we will watch and we will call you uh, into that spot. Another thing about deacons is, is that deacons have wisdom. H how so? What, what do you mean? Well, well there, there's a certain element of skill, if you will, in the management of business affairs. They could look at something and say, no this or no that, right? There's, a, there's, there's the wisdom to be able to make a judgment call, if you will. Um, another thing about deacons, deacons have a good reputation, how so? Well, there's a long-standing good name in the community. You know, talk to one of our deacons. <laughs> and, and you just, you, oh, yeah, I remember so-and-so from all the way here and on this. And hey, listen, I hear the stories around here about our deacons, so it's amazing. In fact, I hear stories about some of you that are not deacons yet, but in 2022, something's fixing the change in your life. It's going to be amazing. And then finally, Acts 6 and 3, right, kind of where we look and see some of these things, uh, we, we find that, that the deacons, uh, that they have to be uh, somebody that's full of the Holy Spirit. They have to be empowered and they have to be gifted by God. It has to be the work of God. So that's kind of structurally something there. Well, let's move on with that structure here because we're mining out the details of this. Uh, and as we move on, uh, we're in the baseline of standards. We're moving from that definition and we're moving into this, this second string of, of looking at the deacons um, we're going to see this outline of qualifications that are given here. That's primarily what we're looking at. So if this feels really narrow in the sense of, of uh, you know, kind of a bullet point type of thing, well, then you're picking up what's being put down in the scripture because that's how it's presented. It's just, it's just straightforward like that. And so these, uh, these qualifications here in verse 8 down through, I don't know, 14 or so, uh, maybe 13, I should say, these things right here, remember, they're dovetailing off of the back of what was already put in place for the elders, okay? So they're just, we cover the stuff with the elders, and these things are just dovetailing right down below that. But in that, in that dovetailing of them, you know, kind of blending together there, please understand that the deacon side, it highlights a different aspect of being set apart for God. There's a, there's a different picture that is attached to it. And so without delay, what are they? Here's the qualifications of a deacon. Um, you know, we, it goes back and forth a little bit with, with uh, do's and don'ts, uh, but they're very simple. Verse 8, uh, likewise, deacons must be reverent. So that's a do. Deacons must be reverent. They must be submitted to God. They must be men of integrity. We go a little bit farther. And, and now we're into this don'ts. They, they shouldn't be like this. They should not be double-tongued. They should not be given to wine. Uh, they should not be greedy for money. They, uh, you know, they, they, they're, they're men that should be committed to the faith. But what do all those things mean? Well, not double-tongued. Uh, literally, they should not be men that are manipulative, that manipulate you or sucker you into doing this or into doing that, not double talk. You know, you hear them giving praise out of this side of the mouth and then, then all of a sudden tearing somebody down out of that side of the mouth. No, 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 that's not a man of integrity. No, it does not go that way. They're not given to wine. Okay, there's, there's a very literal thing that is attached to that, but, but maybe you could understand the broad dynamic of this because, because the principle will extend much farther. And it means that they're not ruled by the gratification of fleshly passions. Okay, uh, can we get that? Can we understand that? Uh, tonight, our study is not about alcohol. Uh, when we do come across things and we dive into that, well, we'll open up that. We'll use uh, Proverbs. We'll use this. We'll use a couple of other uh, passages of Scripture to give you an understanding regarding those things from a scriptural vantage point when we come across them. Right now, we're just going to general list here of, of, of general qualifications Understand it this way, not given to much wine. Just, just realize that, that the deacon should not be ruled by gratifying fleshly passions. Uh, not greedy for money. Uh, I love to say this when it comes to money, uh, that they don't place uh, financial status over a godly life. 
You know, how many people trade, if you will, you know, a, a good name or a good calling for, you know, a, a, just that temporary satisfaction of closing a deal, man. You know, I had to close a deal and I had to do it this way. You know, I, I, I got a promotion, but I had to kind of, you know, cheat on this. No, 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 no. They're not greedy for money. So they're not placing this financial uh, status, if you will, over a godly life. They will recognize God in their life first, even if that means that they will suffer harm or they will suffer loss. Why? Well, because the book of Proverbs tells us that a good man, he swears to his own hurt and he does not change. If he gives you his word, guess what he's going to do? He's going to walk that out, even if it brings him a setback and harm. And that's what we're looking for, folks. That's, that's what we want to see within our church leaderships. And watch, we want to see that within our own life as well. We don't want it to stop with just the leadership. We want to take those things in. Um, and there are also guys committed to the faith. Again, what does that mean? Um, we used to have these t-shirts. In fact, the, the wall of t-shirts here in the back that we have hanging up, if you've never seen them, go take a look, literally, like right behind me here in the hallway. Um, back there, we used to have this shirt that we give to people when they got baptized, you know, all in. You know, that's a deacon, man. They're committed. They're all in. You know, they show up early. They're the last people to leave and all that. And so it's, it's uh, uh, you know, uh, serving Jesus is not some sort of a hobby that they do. No, no, no. It's a passion of their heart. It's a call of their heart. And, and from that, they have a pure conscience, okay? They're not defiled by something, watch, they're not defiled by something that's not on this list. They have a pure conscience before God because they're submitted to the Spirit of God. They're not walking in this place to where they're quenching and grieving God's Holy Spirit. It's like, well, that's a gray issue. I think I'm going to venture out into that gray issue. No, no, no. They yield to the Spirit of God. Um, now, now, look down a little bit farther um, in verse number 10. He says, he says, but let these also first be tested, and then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. So let them be tested. What is this about? Well, let them be examined to ensure that these indeed are the qualities within their life. Let them come through a time where, uh, you know, I like to use this phrase, put up or shut up. You know, is this for real? You know, is this really going on? Um, and, and, and I would tell you, the, the vantage point of looking into somebody else's life um, you know, unless God gives you a word, unless there's, there's something that comes forward by, by way of a discerning of the Spirit, um, and, and it's very specific. Listen, there are things that can pass by when a judgment call is made to put in a pastor, an elder, a deacon, right? You know, we can go through and we can look at all of these things over an extended period of time and we can say yes, yes, and amen, but, but guess what? Guess what Paul also tells us? Take a look at the screen here for 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24. Paul says in this very same book, he says that the sins of some people are obvious, leading them to certain judgment. He says, but there are others whose sins will, will not be revealed until later. In other words, you know, you can do all this, this stuff and, and sometimes people can pull the wool over your eyes unless God intervenes and gives you, uh, you know, that, that, that gift of discerning of spirits. And I'm thankful that on our leadership team that we have two people with that specific gift and it is, uh, for me as a pastor, learning to listen when, when something is hitting those folks, uh, you know, that have that gift of discerning, that they can discern the spirits. Somebody might tell you this, but man, those people with the gift of discernment, they're calling it out and they're saying, uh-oh, that sucker's lying. I don't know what it is just yet, but I'm telling you right now, by the Spirit of God, there's something wrong there. And it always follows through. And I'm not even going to tell you who the people are on the leadership team that have that gift. Because if you're lying, it's going to come out. <laughs> I promise you, it will come out. Uh, well, and, and right, we know that to be true, right? What does the scripture say? Your sin will find you out. Yeah, okay, so we know that's scripturally true. And so, um, what do we say? Um, well, I would say this. Um, practically speaking, uh, you know, these, uh, again, we're just looking at a list of things here. These are a list of qualifications. But if we can turn that application around, and we can understand a, a couple things about our own life. That listen, every one of us are in this race of faith. But it's not how we start the race, folks. It's how we finish the race. And, and, and right now, we're in an age of world history. We don't see this mass explosion of revival. Listen, God is still doing a new work. Every single day, somebody else is getting saved and coming to faith. Yes, that's, that is true. But, 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 but in the sense of the grand revivals that we've seen in the course of our country, that we've seen even during, uh, man, when I was little, you know, the uh, you know, late 60s, early 70s, the Jesus movement that swept across our country and all that. We're not living in that condition right now. 
We're, we're living where the, the government is tore up, where people are at each other's necks, and God's on the way out, not in. Right? That's the time frame that we're living in. And, and, and all of the judgment that falls within that is, you know, it's right here on the cusp. You know, we're, we're experiencing, whether it's, um, uh, <laughs> whether it's national affairs, local affairs, or international affairs, affairs, our country, she ain't the same power horse she once was. It's different. And that's because there's a turning of the face. The face is not no longer pointed towards God. It's the back that's turned towards God. And we know that because of the things that are being played out. And for us practically, while we're looking at elders, while we're looking at deacons, we're in this book, the pastoral epistle, 1 Timothy, we're in this book to see the building blocks of how God builds his church. And we understand from these different things here on a personal level that this is good for my health. I want to make sure that I'm in a, in a church that is following these things. And secondly, I'm just going to generally take away and understand it's not how I start my race, it's how I finish my race. These are the qualifications. I need to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's not acceptable to come in and to learn these particular truths and then just go away completely unchanged. It's not acceptable for a Christian because God has something different and he calls us into a, a deeper relationship with him. And he's so gracious, totally gracious, man. I mean, he does that week by week and year by year and day by day and season by season. Yes, yes, and amen. Uh, and, 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 and he's gonna complete what he started but right now we're in this place to where, you know, where genuine Christians are being sifted from the, the cultural Christian. Remember, the cultural Christian is just a Christian in name only. They don't walk these things out. You know, they can hear these things, but they don't heed these things. And for you guys as believers in Jesus, man, you're getting built up in the word of God. That's why we're so, that's why we're so intense, if you will, about exegeting the scriptures and, and, and not giving you this big to-do list of to-do, but sharing the application and say, now, now go walk this out between you and Jesus and put these things into play. Don't harden your hearts like Pharaoh did back in the Old Testament where he heard and he'd go, yeah, God, I'm sorry. And he was right back to doing stupid stuff again. No, 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 no. Grow in the understanding of what God has given to you. Otherwise, you're gonna find yourself in a hot spot. Not with me. Not in a hot spot with me. And so um, I, I, I struck a note down here uh, that if you find yourself that you're in a relationship with Jesus that your relationship with Christ is in a lower quality today than it has been in days or years gone by, please realize where well, you're moving in the wrong direction. Okay, great. Stop, pause, get right. Uh, and I think they have this verse to throw up on the screen. Psalm 51 verse 10, right? We, we remember that, that David himself, can you, can you see that verse? Can you guys coordinatedly say that together out loud? Man, I believe that one right there. David, right? 53 years old, he, after, after being taken and walked with God so faithfully at a shepherd boy, now he's at the pinnacle and having a united north and south kingdom or uh, northern and southern kingdom and all of this stuff. And he falls into this place of an adulterous relationship that leads to murder and all of these particular things. And when he was called out by the prophet Nathan, this is it, Psalm 51. So if you find yourself in that lower quality relationship with Christ right now, please be encouraged. But there is a remedy there. Call out to God. Ask God to help you. Ask God to create in you a clean heart and a new and right spirit. Okay? The, the, you know, whisper those, those words of faith, if you will. And, 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 and maybe it's helpful. I don't know. That when we ask God to create that word, it's a Hebrew word that, disguise, that describes God making something from nothing. It's the same way he made the world in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, from nothing. God does it from nothing. In other words, you don't have the qualification to come to the table and say, well, God, look at what I've done. And I really, I want to watch. I want to be a better person, God. Well, great. It's wonderful that you want to be all those things. But unless God does that work within you, you're stuck. So call to God and ask him to help you and to create and, 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 and watch the amazingness of what he does. Uh, well, we're at, at time here uh, for our study today. Um, but I have a couple more items on here. Uh, to make sure that we kind of close up and put, a, put the finality on this. So I'm just going to give them to you. Um, the qualifica qualifications go on a little bit farther here, uh, and I'm just going to rattle them off. Uh, it says, likewise, uh, that their, their wives must be reverent, okay? Um, that they should, they should be faithful. Uh, they shouldn't be slanders, right? They should have some of this element of self-control and all that stuff. Um, another one is, is that they need to have one wife, okay? Think about this for a second. You know, there's nothing worse than having a leader a pastor, an elder, a deacon, you know, that's not following this out. 
You know, you, you, you got a guy that's caught in the middle of a divorce. You, you know, you got, you got a guy that's running around with the other women around town and all that stuff. No, 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 no. That is a no-go, folks. No way. You're not standing in the aspect of being an active leader in God's house and you're walking through the middle of that stuff. No. Um, uh, ruling their children in their house as well. Um, now, now, for those of you that, don't, uh, that are single and you don't have children or anything like that, and I'm speaking to the men right now, um, listen, you don't have to be married with kids uh, to be able to stand in the spot as a pastor, an elder, or, or a deacon, okay? That, that, that's not what this is saying. But, 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 but realize what this is saying, and that is, is that the home, that leadership ability is often seen and demonstrated within the home. How the, how the, uh, the marital relationship is and how that is spilling out upon the, 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 the children, okay? So make that distinction there. And then we close with verse number 13. I'll read the verse and we make a wrap here. He says, for those that have served well as deacons, watch this, very, very careful. For those that have served well as deacon, obtain for themselves. Who are they obtaining it for? Themselves. And what is it they obtain? A good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I love this. Deacons earn a good standing and great boldness in the faith by serving well, by walking these things out. Because there is nothing worse for me as a pastor to watch somebody shrink in their relationship with Christ because they feel condemned, because they feel unworthy, because they get confused or they get tangled and they get twisted. Listen, when you walk these things out, you're holding on. You have a good standing for yourself and great boldness in the faith. And that's what I want to encourage this fellowship. Uh, yes, for the call of deacon specifically, by way of application to the body of Christ, Remember what, what in the First um, John, and I forget the chapter, uh, I don't remember if it's chapter 3, I think it might be First John chapter 3, that the Apostle John says later in his life, somewhere, you know, he's an he's old, old, old dude at this point, he says that if your heart condemns you, that God is greater than your heart and he knows all things. Think about that verse for a second. If your heart has come into church tonight and you're being condemned by that heart and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the Father looks upon you not for your own righteousness, but for that imputed righteousness that comes from Christ. You've been, you've been washed, you've been cleansed, you've been born again. And in Jesus, you've been clothed with the righteousness that is not your own. It's not your performance that, that, that earned you a position, if you will, to be able to talk to the Father. That is all done in Christ. And so I want to encourage you to, to hold on to that Hold on to a relationship that if your heart condemns you, listen, and there's something there, you confess it, you get right, you move forward. Quit dwelling over the stupid stuff because it's only gonna leave you in a place of being lazy and depressed and looking backwards. And God's word tells us don't do that. The apostle Paul himself, a guy that could be really depressed because of all the Christians he either tortured, beat, arrested, or killed and all that. And, and what does he tell us? He says, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward towards the upward call. No longer be mentally and emotionally uh, held down, held back, you know, uh, depressed because of those failures. Move forward. Christ is with you. God is for you. He's never going to leave you and he's never for, he's going to forsake you. And the promises that he's given, we are to retain and we're to remember, we're to meditate on these particular things so that the vision and the, and the condition of our heart is always in that place of being healthy before God. Does that make sense? All right. So deacons, what about these deacons? Well, deacons are to live pure lives. Why? Because they bring stability to the church when they do that. And they become good examples of living out the faith. That's the deal with deacons. We want deacons around. We want elders around. We want pastors around. Oh, yeah, guess what? And we want you around. All right? We want you growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And as we, uh, as we walk this out together, God's the one that makes us fruitful as we abide in his word and his word within us. Amen? Will you stand with me and let us pray? My volume felt hot today. Like, hi. I mean, I'm okay with that. I just don't want folks to think I'm yelling at them. I, I don't know. It's not very often I can hear myself. So I'm, I'm deaf, for those of you that don't know. I mean, f at least 50% deaf, like for real. And I don't wear hearing aids up here. Uh, and so it often comes across like I'm, I'm maybe more passionate than what I am, really. Um, it's because I can't hear myself. So I can't hear myself. What do I do? I talk louder. <laughs> well, and if you're in the bang zone, it just, well, it just comes out hot. So.
Uh, let's close our time. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you uh, for drawing us near here tonight and speaking to our hearts. Uh, and I'm praying over these that have, um, that have come out uh, physically, and for those that are watching online, uh, I'm praying that, that you would grow us in the understanding of who you are and what you've set before us. Uh, help us to take heed to the principles that you've laid here before us. Help us to respond to your Holy Spirit. And I pray that your grace and your mercy would be over the top of us uh, and that, that, that you would help us to stay close to you because we know that if there's any change in our relationship, it's because we've moved, not because you've moved. And so help us to stay close to you. And I pray your blessings over the body of believers here in this fellowship. And, and I lift this all up, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said,